Okay. Well, make sure you uh, enter or uh, you know just interrupt me. I guess if you have a question. I don't know if you're able to. If you have a phone, you can join by your phone and use its camera and your laptop. Use both of them. Have two Mackenzies on. Is what I'd prefer if you could do that. Okay. Brixton, that's you where you sat before? Yeah, okay, welcome. So this is spatial economics class. And if you're in the right spot, which hopefully we all are. And I think just because a couple of the new faces, maybe one, I say got my introduction this morning. Most of you have had me in multiple classes, but a few of you, um, microeconomics this morning might have been the first one. So it is possible to take this class and principles. I have macro. You got macro. That's next spring two. Oh, so I don't have to be in class. Not here. Not if you're if you're reading your schedule right. So you sure? You, yeah. I was kind of surprised you were in here. Same thing. Okay. You're for yeah. sure in here. It's it's possible that you can take micro simultaneously with this class, but. I'd want to talk to you a little bit about it, but yeah. um, okay. so well, otherwise you're good if you're, yeah, if you're just in the wrong class. Semester, okay, sounds good. Yeah, so you're so schedule. Schedule. This is on your schedule. Okay, uh, let's talk after class. What about you? I took micro macro. Oh, you had it with Peter. That's why I'm going to see some new faces too. That's right. I forgot about that. Okay, Tyler, and you're a face. I don't know. Yeah, micro. You had Peter. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is fun. All right, so I guess I'll do my uh, a little introduction of myself here. Um, so, did everybody get one of these syllabus? You got extras? Uh, okay, yeah, all right. Ah, we stayed six foot. There we go. Okay. So, maybe I'll go ahead and put this up on the document camera since I got this thing lit up here. All right, so. Um, so I'm Russ McCullough. Uh, I've been here for 10 years now. Unbelievable. I'm up for full professor this year uh, as my promotion, so we'll see if that goes through or not. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting there shouldn't be any hiccups, but uh, we'll see. This I, I learned, I don't remember, sometime this term I'll learn uh, if I got my promotion or not. So uh, I'm originally from Minnesota and uh, was there until I went to Iowa State in 1993. And then in 1997, when I was all about dissertation for my PhD in economics, the guy who I was scrubbing toilets and mowing lawns and renting apartments for offered me a slice of his real estate business. So I ended up getting my real estate license and broker's license. I kind of ran a small sales operation. Uh, but we primarily specialized in college student housing. We had about 800 apartment units across the street from Iowa State and uh, ended up getting into developing subdivisions and buying and selling, flipping homes, fixing them up. I was a partner in a construction company. We did some high-rise buildings. Um, uh, the largest sale in the state of Iowa, private sale, um, when we sold the portfolio, my mentor uh, was a multimillionaire guy, um, uh, died and uh, we ended up selling basically most of a lot of what I built up with him over the time I was with him and it sold for 51 and a half million dollars and that was the largest private sale of now it was a group of properties the largest property was 19 million and then we had a couple other tens and in, in there um, and then we had some other properties so there was like I can't remember 12 properties all in all um, so I have borrowed a lot of money. I've done a lot of development of real estate. Um, I've 
made a lot of money, I've lost a lot of money, and so that's a lot of what I try to bring to the classroom. So I got involved with a co-ownership of a sports bar and grill restaurant was one of my ventures. My wife's a horse person, so I'm a horse supporter. And we developed a uh, horse barn, basically, that had riding lessons and, and some other things going on. on some, and that was because of some ground uh, that we weren't able to develop. Um, and so it was farm ground. We tried to get something through the city with a new subdivision, and they turned us down. And so then I'm like, well, might as well put a horse barn on it. And so I managed to uh, convince our, my mentor partner, uh, Ev, to, to do that. So, um, so what else? We did a bed and breakfast. There was a fraternity that we redeveloped into a 13-room bed and breakfast kind of boutique hotel. So I've dabbled in a lot of different stuff, and that's why I developed this course. Um, I took a course when I was your guys' age uh, called Urban Economics. So the name of your textbook is Urban Economics, and I tried to put kind of just a sexy name on calling it Spatial Economics because uh, it really goes beyond physical land, and I was just trying to be kind of cool. I actually learned there are some other professors out there that use the word spatial, but it's the economics of space, which can be internet marketing and so it's not always physical proximity but I'd say a large part of what we're going to talk about is you know why do cities develop why do they grow um, what causes them to some of them to specialize in um, film production and other ones to specialize in steel and other ones to uh, specialize in insurance right why do we see firms clustering together why do some firms uh, choose to be where they're at so we're going to look at all those incentives. So a lot of it has to do with physical space, uh, but also going to be with economic incentives and other attributes of the company. And so I did a lot of that being a real estate developer. And that's why I really like this course. And uh, the feedback that I've gotten from students over time, this is one of their favorite courses. Uh, we're going to talk about crime and education and um, uh, lots of different types of topics that are, are pretty um, uh, tangible and you know uh, something that you think about but we'll apply some cool uh, economic logic to it okay so this is also one class where you guys aren't going to have a my econ lab or a mind tap or anything this is like old school uh, mostly because uh, I guess it's a unique enough class that the publishers haven't found it profitable to move the content into that otherwise I probably would um, so part of your homework is going to consist of doing back in the chapter problems, and I don't accept digital, so you're going to hand write problems, just like Russ did 30 years ago when he was in this class. Uh, by the way, I looked up my old edition. I had the, because I'm using the same book, but I used the first edition of this book. And I can't remember the name of my professor. It was a female. She was good. I really liked her, but I cannot. That was 30 years ago. I might have to look her up. She's no longer at St. Cloud State, but... Um, I just kind of laughed because when I started preparing for this class, we started with the 8th edition, now we're in the ninth. Um, but I looked at my old notes. I still have my notes when I was in your class, and so a lot of the content is similar. They've, they've made um, revisions over time, but um, anyway, I was first edition of this particular book. So, um, let me go around the room. Do you know if the uh, bookstore has that book? Yes, they should. Yeah, it should be there. If not, um, the ninth edition's been out for a couple of years, so you should be able to Amazon, check it, uh, uh, whatever. But um, try to get the physical book. Um, you could do the digital. I'm not saying you can't do the digital, but um, the, digi the physical's gonna be so cheap. Um, if you guys like physical books, I, I think I would get the physical one. And then as long as I'm talking about books, there's another side book. This one can get, you can get real cheap too on, it's, I think it was published in 2012. Um, but it's a really cool book on the development of the city, and that'll be a, a different uh, book. Uh, well, this one will have some reading due next week. So uh, we'll start in on the introduction in chapter one uh, for that one. And then we'll be digging into this right away, too. So make sure you get this uh, out there uh, and rolling. So uh, with the, this is an eight-week format again. So again, just like all the eight-week classes, we're going to be pounding it hard. So be ready to dig in and, and make sure you got your uh, materials here. So any other questions on that? So it's really just these two physical books um, that is the required stuff. All right, uh, let me go down the list then with you guys. 
Uh oh, extra credit already? Oh, you know what? Too bad. Oh, it's Arizona. Um, too bad we haven't gone over that rule yet, so you guys don't get extra credit. I have. We knew the rule. Yeah, I read it. Well, if one of your phones would have rang, it wouldn't have counted. So we have some new people in here. So actually, I usually leave it so that I do get busted, but I usually wait till after I've gone over the rules. So all right, so we'll, we'll get there. I get a free pass once in a while too, but all right, so uh, so let's see, why don't you tell us what you did over the break, right? So, and where you're from. I know a lot of you, but not all of you, of course, and I don't always remember where you're from. This particular person, I know where he's from, Alvarez. Uh, so just, what, my name or what I did? Name, where you're from, and wh what you did over the break. So I'm Carlos I also happen to know what he did over the break a little bit too, so. <laughs> I'm Carlos Alvarez, and uh, I'm from Colombia. And over the break, I went with the school to Guatemala, and then I went back home to Colombia. And I believe that's it. How was Colombia? A lot of fun, a lot of COVID too. A lot of COVID, you got COVID? Yeah. Did you get bad symptoms or not? Or no, was it just no. a cold? Everybody was partying because we have this carnival, so everybody got COVID. Oh, you guys did the big COVID. carnival yeah. like, like it is in Brazil too? Like it's a yeah. big party, everybody dancing, the all same. that? So COVID ran wild? COVID everywhere. <laughs> yes. All right, well, that's one way to get it out of your system, I guess, so. Well, I didn't tell you this yet. Um, I got COVID when I came back. Dana got stranded in Cancun. So after Guatemala, uh, these guys came home, but my wife and I stayed, and I caught a fish that I'll, oh, shoot, I might as well just show you. So I went uh, fishing on the Pacific coast of Guatemala, and um, it was awesome. We went back to where we were, but uh, there we go. Yes. That's a seven foot sailfish. That was pretty <laughs> awesome. So one of those catches of a lifetime. So, um, and that's my wife Dana that's in there and then our guy who took us on. So. Uh, we did that, and then we um, flew from Guatemala to Cancun, where we, that was more of a, uh, not related to what we did with the student trip or my wife's nonprofit involvement, and it's just vacation time, right? And so Saturday, we went fishing again. Oh, gosh, since I got these out, I got <laughs> So now we're on the Atlantic Ocean fishing in Cancun. And, uh, da, 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 da. So, we caught a ton of fish. There's Dana with a barracuda. We caught about 10 or 12 of those. We kind of lost count. And that's an amberjack that weighs about 40, 50 pounds. We caught about 12 or 13 of those. And then we caught three snapper, and then we caught about 10 or 12 of these ice house fish. It was the best fishing that I had done on the ocean fishing. So we have a great day Saturday morning. Our flight leaves at 7 a.m. Sunday morning. COVID test at 4 p.m. I'm negative, she's positive. So she, the restaurant had a, a deal, the restaurant, the resort, it was an all-inclusive resort. Um, they took out some sort of insurance policy, and so she stayed at the resort until she got a, she was up to 14 days, but she made it home by Christmas Eve. Uh, she flew back. So I was negative. I start to develop a cough Tuesday night. I'm positive Wednesday. So I brought COVID, if you guys need to blame anybody, I brought COVID from Mexico back. <laughs> we're pretty sure we were talking with some, there's a lot of British people, so we think Dana probably got uh, maybe, uh, from the Brits or something, of course we're not sure, but um, so she came home and she's fine, and then I have the sniffles, it was just a cold, it's not a big deal, but I'm a two-time COVID survivor, because I had COVID October of 2020, and that one hit me harder than this one, this one was no big deal. And I'm vaccinated, so I'm like super duper immune, but I'll probably get it again too, so it seems like the way it goes. Okay, so, um, yeah, that was kind of a long introduction for Carlos. So that is Carlos, everybody, from Colombia. Um, Ashley. My first name is Kaylin. I'm from Overland, Kansas. What was the third thing? What did I do over break? 
Yeah. I went to work and then went home. Went to work and then home. Okay, that sounds fun. Where do you work at? Walmart. Walmart. Here in town? Okay. Coddell. Where'd you work at? Home I already knew the answer to this, but I want you guys to kind of engage. Other people don't know all this, so. Okay, home base. Yes, he helped me get some, some stuff yesterday for my boat. Uh, okay, since I'm sharing pictures, um, I'm pretty excited about this. In case you guys don't know, that might not be the last time I talk about fishing. Uh, those of you who have had me before, but. All right, here's my boat. And watch this. There's an audio that goes with it of me saying, still play. So this was my Christmas present. And now that's at the front of my boat. So when I fish alone, I can just, I have a remote control. I can drop the boat. So I was, I saw, Jay, uh, the reason this came up is, not because I love fishing, but because Jacob works at home base where I went in to get a couple bolts to bolt that thing to my to my boat. So that was my project. Colchada! Colchado! Uh, my first name is Julian and I just hung out with family and worked when I could when I was at home. What work? Uh, just like uh, DoorDash and Uber Eats. Okay. And where's home? Houston. X Dean. Uh, first name is Gabe from Iowa. What kind of work? I work at a high beat. High Okay. Farnham. Uh, first name is Tyler. I, uh, from the Bay Area, California. And over Bray, I call my dad paint parking lots. And paint parking lots? Like parking lot lines? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Fox. I'm Jonathan. Uh, I live 20 minutes away at Richmond. And I went to Colorado over the break. Oh, okay, fun. So Colorado, Rocky Mountain High. Did you get some marijuana while you were there? Don't answer that. Uh, <laughs> recorded, but just thought, you know, it's legal there, so. Uh, Cobb. My name's McKenna. Um, I'm from Ottawa. I work at a bank. So it's a lot different from break. Now, my printout has you with one end, but it was with two ends before for McKenna, wasn't it? Was it always one end? Yeah. Oh, I thought on my former sheets. Years. I could go back and I'll review the tapes here, but uh, I, remember, I thought I remember there being two ends. Okay, Medlin. Hi, my name is Lawson. Uh, I'm from Ottawa, but over break, I signed a lease for an apartment in Lawrence, bought a car, worked, and uh, took two trips, one to St. Louis and one to Tulsa. Wow, okay, so moved around. Now, you had my personal finance class, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Okay, so did you pay cash for the car? Yes. You did? Full cash, no loan? Yeah, with the help of parents, of course, but yeah, it's like so, a loan to parents. Loan so a parents. parent loan, okay, take my personal finance class. All right. Okay, news bomb. Jameson, okay, I think I know who he is. Patterson. Austin. Reason. Uh, my person is Zeke. Zeke, go by. Okay. And uh, over break, I went to Cancun. Oh, you went to Cancun too, huh? When did you go? Uh, right when break started, the first week. Okay. And where? Uh, Moon Palace. Oh, you were at the Moon. That's where we originally bought. Uh, we went to Moon Palace a couple times. So I'm a Palace member, and then Palace separated into Hard Rock. So we're actually more the Hard Rock. We've been going to the Hard Rock resorts That's where I've been. Uh, since then. You've been to the Hard Rock one, yeah. so yeah, we were at Hard Rock Cancun, and we actually like a couple of the other ones even better. But uh, they're they're all kind of fun. So Moon is just so enormous. I haven't been there since it's grown even yeah, bigger than what it was three, before. Like, resorts. Yeah, it's it's, it's insane. Weird, you can just like go all through. I mean, it's like a city of five thousand people or something. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, Scalisi. Mandolin. Um, I'm from Las Vegas. You go by Mandolin. Well, Mando. Okay. Mando. Um, whatever's easiest, to be honest. I respond to anything. Um, and over the break, I was just hanging out with my friends and family and saying hi to everyone. No work? No. 
Just visiting all the time? Back in Vegas? Yeah. Uh, Showman. Um, Schumann. Probably Schumann. Schumann, yeah. Uh, I'm from Wellington, Kansas. It's about three hours south here. Um, I went home, worked on, on the farm a little bit, but then I came back up here. I live here in Ottawa now, but uh, then I worked at the San Juan Lawrence. At the where? San Juan Lawrence. Oh, the Lawrence one. Okay, yeah, because we don't call it Sandbar anymore, but it used to be the Sandbar yeah. here, and then they opened up the other place. And... Okay, Simmons. Um, I'm from California, and over the break, I mainly just hung out with my family, and I golfed a lot. And you golfed a lot. All right, what part, what care, where in California again? Was it Sacramento or something? Mackenzie, you're muted. Eric. I actually couldn't hear anything you just said. Uh, where in California? I still can't hear you. Really? Either. Oh. Okay. Now I can hear you. Okay, let me pull this thing out. I don't know if the. It said that the microphone might have been acting up. Maybe we need to replace that. Where in California? Uh, Southern California, like Riverside County area. Riverside, okay. All right, summer. Uh, my name's Bryce. Hunted and work. What did you kill? A lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Start naming them. Deer, geese, ducks, coyotes, raccoons, squirrels. Wow. Small game, big game here. All in. And Stallard. Uh, my name's Andrew. I'm from Derby, Kansas. And I just worked at Kohl's. You just what? Worked at Kohl's. At Kohl's? Okay. Retail. Yeah, they need lots of people. Is that where you've worked before, or did you just pick it up because of the Christmas time? No, that's right. for a couple of years. Okay. All right, so good. We got that done. So you guys come from different places, which is nice for applying it to the to the course. Yeah. Oh, you weren't on the list. Yeah. Um, what's your last name again? Now, I just printed this off, so did you just add it, or? No, it's literally sitting on my schedule for 15 years. Okay, let's talk after class. I'm sorry, give me your first name. Oh, Chris. Chris. All right, yeah, let's talk after class. All right. Um, so, Here's the chapters of the book, which just kind of a flyby gives you a little, helps you wrap your arms around uh, the book a little bit. Trading in factory towns, agglomeration, where do cities develop, central place theory, urban. So our first test, the class is going to have two exams. If you guys wanted to note anything, chapters one through eight is our midterm exam, which will be on Tuesday after week five. So chapters one through eight. Nine is kind of a special chapter that we're going to do something different on, but one through eight, that's going to be test number one. And then we get into the second half of the book, which we're not going to do all of the chapters. We're going to do, uh, we're kind of skip around a little bit. So uh, I should have had those highlighted, but I didn't have them totally highlighted. But we won't be doing all of them, but we'll be doing a lot of them, especially from each section. So part three is land use in the urban areas. So rent and uh, how does rent get determined, housing prices, uh, jobs and people, um, neighborhoods, land policy, like when cities say, oh, you can build a nuclear power plant here, but you can't have housing here, that sort of thing. Uh, cars and roads, so transportation, you know, should we, should we build a subway system or should we do a bus system, right? So uh, cities might be confronted with what would be the best thing for our city? Should we do a, a train system of some sort? Or would a car be better? Um, and then the last section gets into the role of local government. So city taxes, police, education, crime. We'll look at the criminal and see what incentives the criminal faces. So that's kind of a, a, kind of a thumbnail sketch of some of the topics. Um, so 800 points for the course, 150. Uh, exams, 150 points, so 37.5%. So that's going to be uh, how your grade's determined. And if you do your homework and you come to class, you should be successful in the class. If you miss out on one of those, uh, then you're going to be hurting yourself a little bit as we go. So stay up on the homework and come to class. 
The problems on the test will be similar to what I cover in class and the topics, and we'll have some examples. And we will also work through some of the homework problems after the due date. Um, so if you guys didn't quite get them all and that sort of thing, and that'll give us a time to review and, and go over the concepts. Uh, so then there's a paper that we'll talk about in detail here uh, when we flip over the page. Um, and then these homework problems. So the homework problems turn out to be pretty much gimme points. Uh, those of you who had me before, you know that I like to stack the class with some easy points, and these are like gimme putts, and I'm, I'm using a fictitious putter. Who was, oh, Mackenzie was the one doing uh, golf over the break. Um, so a gimme putt is something that you just give the students. Now you guys have, I'm not totally giving you the points, but the, the answers are there, and if you do the work, you should get 100%. Um, but if you don't do the work or you're late with your work, then you won't get all of those points. Um, so I, I fully expect you to get all of those um, in-class work and homework points. So exam number one, Tuesday week five. Exam number two, Friday, the last day of class, week eight. And then we'll have that paper due Wednesday of week eight. Wednesday night, it'll be like a midnight type due date. All right, any questions there? All right, flip it over. Exams are multiple choice and short answer, and they will be in class for this one. So kind of old fashioned again, uh, in class exams. Um, I do not give makeup exams, but uh, if you have a legitimate reason for missing, you can notify me prior to the exam. Uh, always bring a calculator and a brain full of economic insights. Most of the homework will consist of selected back of the chapter problems. Uh, you'll be doing the problems by hand and uploading scans or pics of your work. Literature review. All right, we're, we're going to cover this later, so I'm just going to skim it a little bit because we'll end up kind of going in more detail later. But um, so for some of you, you haven't done a literature review paper for me. Others like entrepreneurial, this is kind of the same setup. So you'll pick a topic and you're going to be going to scholarly work. So economics journals. Um, we're not going to be just Googling and picking up the first uh, trash magazine that happens to talk about big buildings or something, right? So um, we're going to be look, looking at uh, literature that has been written by economists and have been kind of audited by economists is why we do that. Um, APA uh, format and um, you'll develop kind of your thesis question of something that's related to the class. We'll be using the JSTOR again um, as a, one of the ways you can find these journals. And we'll talk more about accessing that later. Um, we'll have a topic due date. Um, that's going to be in week six. So if you want to put week six, um, we'll determine later what day, but it'll probably be uh, let's just go ahead and put Tuesday, week six. And so with topics, you guys will have kind of been exposed to material, and you can kind of think about what looks interesting to you, and you'll just find to start the process of looking for those papers. So that'll kind of get your engine going so that you have plenty of time to, to do it. Um, I might add here, I don't have all the details worked out, but uh, Dr. Jacobson, Dr. Clark, and I are going to Vegas. And you guys could probably come. Um, there is sometimes some reduced rates. You're going to have to pay some money. We don't, I don't know. I'm going to try to get some scholarship money available. But there is a student poster competition. So they use the word poster, but they literally you bring a physical thing, which is kind of a demonstration of maybe some work. And it could be something that you did here. Um, it could be from something else. And uh, you do have to submit and get it um, approved. So I'm not sure about the due dates and stuff. Um, but anyway, there is an undergraduate that uh, you do have to be 21, though. So I'm not sure everybody's 21 in here or by then. Uh, because it is Las Vegas, uh, the, the organizers of the conference, it's the Association for Public Enterprise Education uh, is the name of the conference. But being that it's Vegas, they just don't even want to mess with it if you're 19 or 20 and stuff. So, so plenty of opportunities to get in trouble in Vegas, so, as you guys know, if you've watched a couple movies of different sorts. All right, so um, you can kind of keep your eyes open for that. But that's a possibility uh, to engage in the undergraduate student competition uh, in Vegas 
as a as an outside thought there. Uh, use of personal digital devices. So, turn off your vibrate and your ringer. Do not engage with your device. Turn off instant messaging, close email, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what do we got? Bryce and Mando and Carlos and Julian. So. Basically, um, you know, you should be shutting down some of those external things, little pop-ups that might come. And then you need to take your phones, if they're on the desk right now, and store them in your pocket, turned off, or in your backpack. So no phones on the desks. Um, <clears throat> you will lose points by not separating yourself from your personal digital device. Internal distractions like daydreaming and good old-fashioned disruptions of ex excessive talk with a neighbor will not cost you any points, but will be subject to a verbal lashing or a different seating assignment at my discretion. Every now and then you might pick up a few extra credit points by driving, dragging yourself to class, making it through a lecture mind. You may also earn some of these points by answering correctly some of the tougher questions I stir up in class. Points can go the other way too. An incoming ring will cost you a point. However, an incoming ring for me gets you a point. And so those of you who are new to my structure, if that were to happen again, everybody who's present if my phone rings and I forget to shut it off, then you get a point. And it usually happens a few times during the semester, so. All right, um, academic integrity, don't cheat. Could be an F on the item or reporting to the dean. Writing format, APA. Um, refer to the handbook for other stuff. And the, the other stuff, by the way, there's a, more items on the Blackboard shell too for the syllabus. This is kind of my short uh, version of the syllabus. And then other, if you have any special needs or special accommodations, uh, make sure you discuss them with me at the beginning of this uh, term or as soon as you become aware of them. All right, any questions on syllabus? All right, we will shelve that. Let's, I guess I never plugged in my... We will do a little bit more PowerPoint type stuff with this class, which is, those of you who've had me before, a little bit unusual. We'll do plenty of other stuff as well, but. <coughs> All right, so. <coughs> let's kind of get motivated on, oops, what am I doing? What is this thing on? Lost my pointer. Keep your ink. Oh, discard. Oh, did I accidentally press that? I don't know what's going on. Oh, well, for one thing, I guess I'm not on that. I didn't realize. Okay, so now I gotta turn off this ink thing. I think maybe I just do that. There we go. Okay. So ignore the red lines there. Um, so this kind of, uh, it, at the back, so what the author does in the first opening chapters is try to set the stage of some of the economic principles that we're gonna be bringing forward. And so um, in the background always, hopefully, as you start to move through your economics training, we like to think about incentives, right? And so what motivates people? So one of our baseline assumptions in for the firm, for the company, is that they want to maximize profits. So that won't disappear here as we decide on should we locate on the south side of Ottawa or on the north side of Ottawa, right? So the profit maximization uh, concept is always there. And so we have uh, princi our principles of microeconomics and ways that firms uh, maximize profit. All of that will be applied in different ways here in this class. And then utility maximizing choices. How would you describe utility from previous classes? What are we talking about with utility? Are we talking electricity and gas? Happiness. Hookups? Happiness, good. So happiness of the individual. So with a utility, when we hear the word utility, we're talking about the consumer now, not the business typically, right? Not, not always, but for the most part, we're thinking about the demand curve and what is the benefit of of um, go having to be able to travel to that south side of Ottawa for the smoke creations and look at the demand. So you, they're looking to maximize their happiness, and so the location 
of the business is going to play into their utility function or their happiness function, right? So they might love the food at Smoke Creations, but it's so far of a drive to go to South Ottawa, so that's going to factor into the decision process on whether they choose to patronize that business. <clears throat> okay, so why do cities exist? Why do competing firms cluster? Why is cities? These are all questions we're going to tackle. Which one of these questions interests you the most? Uh, Lawson, number between three and seven. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I can't. The second one, why do competing firms cluster? All right, what, what's interesting about that question to you? Um, what does it mean to you, I guess? I mean, we, we haven't had any materials, so. The south side of Ottawa, that's where all the fast food places are. So they all, all okay, yeah, yeah. Ottawa is certainly our, our fast food corporate type stuff is on the south side. Um, interestingly enough, um, especially you locals, some of the other people outside, what's on the uh, north side of Ottawa? What kind of manufacturing? Oh, the industrial. The industrial park, but there's actually, it was kind of interesting when I you know, moved to Ottawa and started learning the area a little bit. There's actually quite a bit of the production of something out there on the south side. Does McKenna or Lawson, who's Very my other local? local? We have one other local? Uh, Richmond was it, not too far, right? You're in Richmond? Yeah. But you wouldn't know Ottawa as much, huh? Is it Calmar? Calmar's related to it, in a sense. There's a lot of steel manufacturing. So there, there's like three or four different companies that are related to fabricating metal or uh, steel fabrication of some sort. So I kind of figured that's a little bit of a cluster. I think some of it could be parts for Calmar, I'm guessing, over time anyway. And then there's been other, other things that have gone. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the trophies, if uh, Hasty Awards, I'm not sure if they take advantage of, of maybe some of the metals for some of their stuff that they do or they're, they're kind of retailing that I think but it's probably outsourced other places but yeah so why do firms cluster together okay good um, anybody else which question sounds interesting let me just open the floor rather than hit the random number generator Carlos number four, number four. so that is this one yeah. what causes urban growth and decline what, what causes cities to expand and shrink and a lot of this book is going to address that. And this is in a very approachable way. It is, he wrote this for the layperson, so it's not econ jargon you know, all the way through. He's just going to tell a really um, some cool stories about um, city growth and decline. So yeah, we see some cities shrinking. Um, I gave a talk one time in North Carolina to uh, a city that was um, trying to do stuff to keep from shrinking, basically. And at the end of my talk, they asked, you know, what, you know, what advice, essentially, what would you say about our town shrinking? Are we doing the right things? And, and I said, well, I don't have a really good answer for you. Um, but some economists have been studying on how do you shrink smartly? Like, let's embrace the fact that we're shrinking and think about shrinking in a wise way. What a lot of small towns do is they continue to throw money at new projects and try to attract new jobs. Unfortunately, Ottawa, uh, I've had mixed feelings. I, I'm hoping it's gonna come around. And Ottawa's in a little bit unique place that we've been doing some good stuff, but uh, we dumped a bunch of tax dollars into developing that south side that we've been talking about, the commercial area, across the freeway. And so part of my property tax dollars um, go towards that project, and we haven't found anybody yet. And we've been at this now for, I think, five, six, seven years, maybe, um, trying to uh, get somebody to take that property. Um, so I served on the Franklin County Development Commission uh, for a while, representing OU. And um, so I've been out to that and learned about it. And, you know, they're trying to beat the bushes. And they're looking for a big manufacturing. So the idea is let's attract somebody. They're going to have 50 to 100 new jobs. And they're going to be good paying jobs and you know, all that stuff. Well, the other side, me being the free market guy, is to, is that a wise way to spend our city tax dollars, or do we just let the market figure that out? And there, there's pros and cons to both, by the way. So um, sometimes assembling the land can make you good. Right now, it's been a little bit of a bust uh, for Ottawa. And 
Unfortunately, it's been a bust in a lot of towns around the United States doing that same thing, trying to push growth. And so my recommendation to cities is to try to embrace what does a smaller city look like? How can we make a great smaller city? Um, is not a bad approach, I think. And why fight off the market? Why are people leaving you? Uh, well, there just might be better opportunities in Lawrence or in Kansas City or whatever. And so maybe we can find a happy smallness that really works and makes the, the community um, still a great place to live, even though it's smaller than what it used to be. Rather than having time after time at coffee and the, and the brewery of, you remember back in the 50s when Ottawa was really, really zinging? I've gone to Rex's barber shop here, and Rex gave me a haircut. I don't even know if he's still cutting hair, but he retired. He did retire, so I got one of his last haircuts. Apparently, um, <clears throat> this was like five years ago. I, I go to somebody else in town, but um, he told me I didn't know this until I was in his chair. But he had cut Wayne Angel's hair uh, back in the day because I I hold the, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I hold the Wayne Angel Chair of Economics. So Wayne Angel was an economics professor and went on to the Federal Reserve and all this great stuff. Um, and uh, he said back in the uh, 50s, Ottawa and Lawrence were about the same size. And Lawrence is now, is it up to 90,000 or 70,000? It's like, I looked it up the other day because well, I lived there and my brother was asking me and it was like 98. 98, wow, really, okay. I swear when I came here it was 70 10 years ago. So it's definitely grown quite a bit there. So you got, Town of 90,000, and then you got Ottawa. Anybody know the population of Ottawa? Like 11, 12. 13-ish, yeah, I've heard 11 on the low and, and over the years. I think we're at around 13 or pushing 13. Well, guess how much we had in 1955? About 12 or 13. It, it, it's been about the same size for year after year after year, but what was surprising to me when Rex told me that was that Lawrence was similarly sized. And so when there was the battle of Ottawa versus Baker and, and then some other things, well, what caused Lawrence to grow? KU, my state tax dollars, which I didn't really look here at the time. But all the state choosing to locate the state university and forcibly take dollars from people's pockets in Kansas that live way out in Gardner, uh, southwestern Kansas, taking those dollars and plowing them into KU, right? Now, I'm obviously painting a little bit of a different picture than you normally hear. Like, where you're usually like, oh, state universities are so good. They do the research and they, they solve problems and blah, 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 blah. Well, do they completely do that in a successful way? That, that's sometimes questionable whether, you know, do, do you guys get a pretty darn good education that um, matches up with the state school education? I'd say, yeah, at least, my class and be an econ major, but uh, outside of that, I can't speak for everybody. But no, no, I mean, but the, the point is, we are a private institution, they get state tax dollars. But from this class perspective, their city grew to 97,000, whatever, some 90 some thousand, and most of that growth was all spurred through state tax dollars year after year from 1950 to 1960s, 1970s. I mean, think about the decades of, of growth um, in, the, in the KU system. So, all right, and what is today, the 10th? No, yeah, no, yes, yes. What? today's 10th, yeah. yeah. So Cyclones play KU tomorrow in basketball, so go Cyclones. Uh, Gabe, right? You got to be going Cyclones. No, are you a Hawkeye completely? Can't even root when it's against Kansas, against the Jayhawks. Come on, the Jayhawks, as usual, look great. I mean, they're probably Final Four material. So, and I actually do root for the Jayhawks if they're not playing the Cyclones for the most part. Um, but anyway, part two, land use. What question interests you? Give these a read. What is the price? One, two, three, four, five, six, price. Which one interests you? The third one. 
the third one. Why are there dozens of municipalities in the typical metro area? Okay, so yeah, why do we have um, lots of different little governments in a metro? So if we look at Kansas City, what we call Kansas City or the Kansas City Metro includes Overland Park and uh, Lee Summit. Uh, who's, oh, that was JC who was saying he got an internship in Lee Summit. <clears throat> you know, it includes two states, which is kind of unusual. Uh, we'll talk about that later. That, that, that leads to a lot of uh, different, what's called border studies, where you look at if the taxes are different in Missouri versus Kansas, we can, and, but people live on State Line Road. Literally, there's a road called State Line Road that some of you have been on, maybe not all of you. And so here you're in Kansas, and then whoop, across the street, your neighbor lives in Missouri, right? And so if the sales tax is different, or if other things, how does that change behavior? Or when there is a change in policy, how does that change? So lots of different municipalities. Um, we'll get into stuff like voting with your feet and moving to different municipalities and choosing the bundle of local goods. Like let's say one um, city tends to have a really strong police system and they're great and they, they work with kids and they have kids programs. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. But you really like the police system there, but the mayor sucks. And then this one, the medical system's good. The police are okay, uh, you know, whatever. So you can choose where to live on a bundle of the local public goods, right? The parks, and is there a water slide or not? And you know, if you have young kids, is there the, the zero thing with the little dolphins squirting water into it or not, right? And so you can move to different locations to take advantage of that. But the city that has more amenities also has more what? typically taxes the taxes are higher right so that's the kind of trade-offs but that um, that's why we see different municipalities evolve over time as you can think about it as I want to live I hate the city the way it's run it's so stupid I'm gonna start my own city you know back a hundred years ago that was probably true right where you could literally start to form new cities or new cities form because they didn't like the way things were run and that's part of the reason we see that. And so our ability in the United States to do that type of thing, that we don't need a blessing from Biden, uh, from the top big federal government to do that, we can just kind of let things happen. We empower the local uh, levels to do stuff. All right, somebody else, another question that looks interesting? Yeah, number two, Jacob says, why do people of firms build up instead of out? Yeah, okay, so that, the economics of that is really fun to get into. Um, so I, that's what I got involved with up at, at Iowa State. Um, our first building that I lived in was a six story building and then uh, that one I didn't really play in the development. I was still finishing up my, uh, or working on my degree. And then I got involved with some uh, 13 story. I, I built the, I, I shouldn't say I, we, because I was a very tiny partner, but I was involved in a lot of the design phase of it. And I kind of came up with this cool idea, if I can toot my own horn, of me. So there was a seven story restriction. So you couldn't have higher than a seven story building. So I dug into the architectural and engineering codes and learned that you can have a 20 foot high story with a mezzanine, as long as the second story, but we call it a mezzanine, the mezzanine lofted area can't be more than one third of the floor area below. So I basically helped to design a two story unit in a seven story building with four stories of parking garage and the whole thing was 127 feet which is the equivalent of about a 13 story building. And so after that little loophole they changed the code and they decided to go with a height restriction rather than a story restriction after McCullough busted them down and, and was able to put more density in than they were planning. What they were trying to do was control the number of bodies that could be in this already kind of a, it was a campus town area like in Lawrence on Mass Street uh, or any other college university town except ours because ours is relatively small but we don't have like a, a campus town uh, hub. Well, that's where we did this development. Okay, um, all right. So urban transportation, give those a read. One, two, three, four, five, six. Julian. The last one. The 
The last one, what would be required for a light rail system to pay for itself? Um, so it's going to be fun. You're going to see this in that book and in our book. Um, but city planners suck at figuring out the best spot to put a rail system as the city's developing. They kind of really suck at it. Why? Because there's just not enough good information. They sometimes perceive if I put the rail system here, the city will develop around it, but the city might want to develop over here for other reasons that they can't even fathom 10 years prior. And so cities aren't very good at that. Um, and so it is, it, some of them are successful if you get a real <coughs> dense area. You, you guys, how many people have been to New York and ridden the subway or London subway? Places like that, just a couple of you. So that one, it's pretty easy to see the benefits, right? So when we have that type of density with the high rises of, of New York City and you're moving people, those things are moving all the time. So there are places where it can work. And so some of that's going to come on the utilization of you know, how, if, if you can get a rail system in there. That's why Elon Musk, um, his idea of the underground boring thing, have you guys seen that or heard about that? He did that like 10 years ago. It, I think it's mostly um, dead now. Um, they were going to build one from Kansas City to St. Louis was one thing that was talked about, where it would be, uh, that was the tube, I guess. That, that one might have been above ground. But um, all that stuff is kind of hard to justify if you don't have enough bodies moving back and forth on it. All right, I don't know, did any of you do any papers or anything on Elon Musk with that tube? It seemed like I've had some people do papers or something. Did you know a little bit about yeah, it? Go ahead. What, what did you learn about Z? Yeah, and there was enough. It was, uh, wasn't it LA to the Bay Area yeah. or something? Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, and I think they started it too. Yeah, it was a cool idea. He has like a test just trip. That's what it is, yeah. a test trip, but it's kind of a test trip yeah. to nowhere and yeah. it's kind of. It's just to like. It's I think it's kind of dying on the yeah. vine at this point, but yeah. Because it's so hard to go through a big yeah. city. Yeah. yeah, they have that cool looking machine that kind of gobbles up dirt and rock and whatever and can bore a hole. Uh, so it's a cool concept, but again, hasn't hasn't panned out like his Tesla and SpaceX. He's been busy putting people into space lately, so if you haven't uh, read that. All right, so look these over. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mackenzie. Uh, just which one interests me the most? Yeah. The wired crime rates higher in larger, large cities. Okay, wired crime rates higher in larger cities. Um, so that's a fun one to look at. Um, we look at big cities and we're like, oh, they, they attract crime or people become criminals when they live there because they learn. And it turns out um, cities are pretty attractive for poor people because it's a sign of prosperity so if your crime rates are going up and there's a lot more poor people it might be because your city is successful it's kind of counterintuitive but people who are looking for new opportunities and stuff because they're poor might come to your city to try to take advantage of the benefits of the city and so there might be some correlation there of it being prosperous and we could think of it being prosperous that oh well now all the rich people live in the city so i'm going to go steal stuff from them uh, but that's not the full story so there's some interesting insights that'll come out with that Black market. um <laughs> other people question interesting question let me go lawson uh why did crime rates drop in the 1990s ah yeah so uh we've actually learned this one in freakonomics in intermediate does anybody remember? Not all of you had intermediate yet, but does anybody remember? I can't remember who did the topic. And there's other factors, but it was pretty good evidence. And actually, that, uh, that particular thing is being challenged uh, now all the way up to the Supreme Court because of what Texas did. What uh, laws did Texas change recently that's been pretty controversial? Huh? No, not that. 1990s, that's what's going on. There's a little bit of that. We did a podcast on, on that. Uh, Does that that San Francisco tax? stuff, they've raised the bar on what's the legal crime. Like, you can steal stuff and basically not pay the consequences on it, which is insane. Is that the new tax? No, it was abortion. 
abortion. You're like, what the hell? Abortion? What do you mean? So there's other factors, by the way, that we'll talk about. But Freakonomics brings out an interesting study. Does anybody remember when Roe v. Wade passed? 1971, if I remember correctly. And when do you become an official human being in the United States, an adult? 18. <laughs> no, I'm not getting into fetuses and stuff, but we're not going to go there. But. So, 18 year old. 71 plus 18, 1971 plus 18 puts us in what time frame? Nice. 88, 89, 90. And so the work that Freakonomics did is that possibly if there's unwanted children growing up, then they get neglected as they're growing up and they turn into criminals when they grow up. And when Roe v. Wade passed, there was less unwanted, I'm, I'm not trying to get religious or anything, I'm just stating the facts, and this is in uh, some literature and in the, the Freakonomics, is that if there's less unwanted children, then there's more children proportionately being cared for and loved and getting blah, 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 growing up to be less chance of a criminal. And the reason this, is, this was, the study is compelling is that some cities passed the law before, and they found some statistical evidence that even a few months before, the crime rates in the places that passed Roe v. Wade uh, at a different time, there was like a timing difference, then their crime rates dropped two months before these guys' crime rates dropped. That was a statistically significant finding. So, kind of interesting study, again, uh, ignores, so this is a lot of what um, economics does, it, it's, it's called the, we have the Nobel Prize in Economics because we, we study what's called positive economics, not normative. I mean, there, we can talk about normative, I should say not economics, but positive issues and normative issues. So normative issues is what we should do. Should abortion be legal or illegal? That's a totally different question. Positive issues deal with empirical facts. And so all we're saying is we're not putting a judgment call on whether it should or should not be, but here was the evidence that crime rates fell 18 years later after 1971. And so um, we just look at the data, and the data is what it is. Um, it might be that uh, the normative part would be <sighs> crime rates, who cares if somebody's getting their car stolen, we just killed a baby, right? So now all of a sudden you're doing that moral trade-off, right? So you guys get what I'm talking about here? The normative issue versus the positive, the science of it. The science is the statistics, it just is what it is. And we just report that. And that's kind of what you're gonna find when you do your uh, literature reviews and stuff too. Um, okay. Nobody picked, did anybody interested show of hands with the optimum level of crime? I'd say on this picture, that's the one I like the most. Jonathan, what do you, what do you like about that one? I mean, you would think that all crime is bad. Yeah. Yeah, so isn't the optimal crime rate zero, or the opt optimal level of crime zero? No. What can you guys think of that what would be the argument of why it shouldn't be zero? Lawson? I said kind of earlier, uh, some about the black market. I mean, it's good for the economy in a sense. Um, that, that wouldn't be one of the reasons here, but you're right. I mean, that is an aspect of the economy, and then you would still... Uh, well, that is criminal anyway, so right, you can change, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, you can change the law and you'll just make criminals out of people who are gonna to continue to do what they do anyway. Uh, let me go to Aaron. Um, well, if you have no crime rate, then what is the purpose of having police? Okay, good, Jonathan? You told a story, I think it was last, last semester, about a, like a kid who threw a brick through a baker's window and the guy had to come and fix it without crime, then that guy that came to fix the window wouldn't have a job either. Okay, yeah, that's the broken window fallacy, and, and uh, that's maybe a little bit more similar to what Lawson was commenting on, that it, that's going to be part of it. Here's the thing, if, if we wanted to really crack down on crime, uh, let's just pretend, I don't know the real number, but let's say we have 15 officers, uh, 15 squad cars, and uh, I don't know, you guys who are locals might know this better, how many police do we have on hand at any given point in time? Seven? 
with the county sheriff and the police, would you say seven, eight? Like if you had a big thing, how many squad cars would come? It can't be more than maybe eight or so? Yeah, I'd say like seven. Seven or eight? Let's just, let's just say to pick out a number eight. How could we make crime be less? Would nine potentially help lower the crime rate if we had nine? A person and a squad car, by the way. I'm not just getting a squad car. If we had nine people patrolling, would, would crime potentially be a little less? No, it would just be caught more. Like, it would still be going on. Right, but it would be caught more, but then people would start to see, oh, I almost never used to see uh, cops in, in Ottawa before, but now I see one a little more frequently. You might mind the speed limit a little bit more, right, or whatever. And then let's just get obnoxious. Would, wouldn't uh, doubling it reduce crime rates? One police officer, one squad car. How about tripling it? Would that start to reduce crime rates? How about 100 squad cars and 100 police officers on every corner? You're being watched all the time. Would that likely reduce the level of crime? So is, it, is the optimal, maybe we'll drive it close to zero? You know, we're always gonna have a little, but is zero the right amount? What would be wrong? Well, why don't we have 100 police officers on every corner? The cost, right. So it comes back to a cost benefit. We reach a level of crime where we mostly have, you know, whatever, three burglaries a month, and each burglary has $2,000 of monetary damage. That's $6,000, right? So now maybe if we're trying to reduce burglaries, we shouldn't be spending more than six, right? So now all of a sudden we, put it, we look at it in a different lens to say, you know, let's try to keep the killers off the street. That might be a good start. Um, if we can get it down to monetary damages, now we can compare the price of a policeman uh, or woman, a police person. Do we call them police? Price of police. What do we call them? Is a police woman and man, do we make that distinction? Or is there like, so it's a fisherman, right? I learned this because I'm a fisherman. Uh, you don't say fisher woman. We just kind of changed it to fisher. Police Did you guys know that? Yeah, you're just a fisher. I'm a fisher. I don't know. You know, language changes over time, but that way you're not putting the male-female distinction on it. But I was just thinking with police, police men and women, police officers, yeah, thank you. I knew there was a very simple word that we use frequently, a police officer. So police officer and a squad car, um, you know, what do we pay our police? What do you figure we pay our police? Not enough. Not enough. Anybody know? 45, it does go up, but I'm saying a starting officer. Starting out, working here in Ottawa. Like 40, Probably like 39. I'm not even sure it's in the 40s, honestly. Yeah, so I, like I'm 90, thinking mid-30s maybe, or? 30, 30, 30. Yeah, 35 to 40, you gotta go to the academy. They are starting to require, I think, an undergraduate degree in some places, not all, um, uh, in addition to the academy. So 40,000 a year just for the person, and then you've got the police car and the gas and the equipment. Uh, anybody know what a police car runs? like a fully outfitted uh, police car? It's just a Ford Explorer, right? Well, so let's start with that. What is that, 35, 40,000 maybe? A brand new one? Yeah. Let's call it 35,000. How much equipment do you think's in there? <laughs> they got some sweet equipment, right? I mean, there's at least gotta be 15,000, if not $20,000 worth of equipment. And they beef up the motor, right? So they can, it's not the little six cylinder that we, you can buy the cheap low end of the, of the Ford Explorer. The sweet paint job with the smoked, you know, the smoke black uh, stickers and stuff like that. So we probably got 65, 70,000, I would guess, maybe going in a, in a police vehicle with equipment and stuff. So now we've got 70,000 up front, and then we got to pay gas and the normal stuff. And police put a lot of mileage on, right? Because they're patrolling. So uh, there's a decent amount of gasoline and all that ongoing spend. So, the portal of that, is it worth it to reduce burglaries by one if the average amount of loot that is being taken is 2,000 bucks, 2,000 times 12 months is, 20, uh, is 24,000, 
And so now I've got a $70,000 cop car, a $40,000 police officer salary, and uh, gas and equipment. All of a sudden it's like, oh, the optimal level of crime. There is some amount of crime that we should think is acceptable, and it's done in a very rational, uh, economizing way, right? A cost-benefit analysis. And, but it's kind of different, the types of things that we'll take into account. Okay, any questions or comments there? Fun, fun, fun. All right, housing and public policy. <clears throat> Let's see here. I think we need to start there maybe to get something different. One, two, three, four, five, six. Aaron. Bang per buck of public housing. Okay, so um, public housing has had kind of a, a black eye for a long time. So the idea was everybody deserves a house and the government's gonna come in and we built the housing projects in, uh, usually started off in New York, but other bigger cities. Uh, this was in the 60s, by the way, on the war on poverty. Um, and so what are we really getting out of it? And there's been a, a disaster in different ways. Um, but bang per buck, how much benefit per dollar spent, right? So how do you measure that, that we're giving somebody a house or subsidizing their housing? Um, it's, there's a lot of different elements to that uh, when we're having uh, some transfer of public funds into private hands. Doesn't that go along with like the 2009 financial crisis, right? Because of the housing? Well, a lot of that was private though, but it was, it was government intervention in but not when we're thinking public housing here it's more of publicly provided housing so are you guys familiar with habitat for humanity yeah. now that's a private nonprofit company that helps assist homeless people or people needing homes uh, to do it so I sometimes there might be some community funds that somehow are, is part of the donation but for the most part it's a private effort instead of using government tax dollars to help provide housing um, it's a little bit different. Now, this kind of touches on a little of what I was talking about with um, development, though. Um, other types of uh, housing developments can have tax incentives and tax abatement. That's part of what I did as a real estate developer. Um, if we would go in and uh, develop something a certain way, uh, low-income housing is one of those. Then, So we're going to build small, affordable homes, and almost every town pays lip service to this, but then they really don't do it. And then developers come in and it's an easy way for them to make a buck on something um, and so it might be something that would have formed anyway uh, the rents are capped maybe for uh, the first five years like you you agree that you're not going to charge more than X amount for a three bedroom unit after five years expires then boom it's market rates for it you know and so is it worth it to have that type of tax dollar at work and in some cases, there might be some evidence that it is, in other cases, it won't. And that's what we're gonna learn in this class is kind of how do we weigh out the costs and benefits of it. Okay, another person with an interesting question up here? The last one. The last one, how much tax revenue is lost because of the mortgage subsidy? Yeah, that one definitely speaks a little bit more to uh, uh, the financial crisis. So um, subsidizing uh, mortgages um, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all of that stuff. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Chris? <coughs> the third one. The third one. Who bears the cost of the property tax? Okay, so, um, so local governments, by the way, the police, edu uh, uh, our K through 12 system here, and, and fire department, all of that is local property taxes. So when you pay your property tax bill, most of that stays within your town or your county. Um, sometimes a little bit of it can, can go to the state in different ways, but most of it uh, ends up staying um, locally. And so who bears the cost? So Kansas actually is bad on property tax nationwide. We are one of the worst states in terms of property tax levels um, around the nation. And so there's a, 
the Kansas Policy Institute is a group that I've worked with and did some student events with over time, but they are kind of been watchdogs for that and help to um, keep uh, public officials accountable for that. So you're raising the taxes to do what, right? Um, so uh, who bears the burden? Um, it's the property owners, but then when they go to sell their property, then there's a sharing of that, right? Uh, of who's uh, the value, if you have high, let's say you've owned a place for 10 years and property taxes were here, but they went up. What happens to the value of your property when taxes have climbed 20% and you go to sell it 10 years from now? It goes down, right? So the value, because your property taxes are higher, then the value would go down. All right. Um, let's see, any other ones on this one? The voting thing is, is a fun thing that we'll, we'll investigate more in this class than any other class we've done. So majority rule, um, is that the fair system? Democracy, yay, democracy. I really hate it. Democracy is a necessary but not sufficient way to get good results. So people hang their hat on democracy. Oh, if we only had majority rule, we'd get it right. No, you wouldn't. You really can get it really messed up, actually. So democracy is not all that it's cracked up to be. People put a little too much weight in democracy. And when I say democracy, by the way, sometimes people muddy it up. But really, democracy just means you're going to cast a vote and majority is going to be the way we go. But of course, that trumps on the minorities' rights, right? There's 49% uh, or, or uh, so that, that didn't get their way. All right, so what is a city? So what do you think the urban area is? Just throw a number out there. How many people in an urban area, so where we're going, urban area, urban population, metro area, metro, micropolitan area, principal city, just to kind of throw some numbers out there. Urban area. What do, in order to be considered an urban area, by governmental standards, by the way, and, and researchers use these standards, throw me out a number. Is that a million, a billion, a 2,000? Urban area. Are you in 100,000? Acres. Uh, this is population, just numbers of people. Numbers of human beings. 100,000. 100,000. 2,500. Urban population, so that's what the urban population is, people living in urban areas. A metropolitan area, at least, you got a five here. Five million, 50,000. 5,000. 50K. Snuck one on you. 50,000 people. Micropolitan area. It's got to be bigger or smaller than 50. Bigger or smaller than 50? Smaller, survey says. 10,000 to 50,000. All right, and then, um, so the Kansas City metro area, the principal city is the one with the largest population. All right, so conditions for cities. Why do cities exist? What do you think an agricultural surplus is? Agricultural surplus. Whatever extra food a farmer doesn't sell? Yeah, extra food that they don't eat, actually, would be part of it. Um, so the, the old idea of sustainable living, what you eat, what you make is what you eat, kind of our production possibilities frontier type of thing. Um, anything above that is a surplus that you can sell to the market. And in reality, of course, they sell it all and then they buy food from Hy-Vee or other places, right? All right, we're going to call it a day there. We'll see you tomorrow.